Hey y'all! In this video, I'm going to continue with our discussion of carving 3D files by importing an STL file that was created in a different software program. To get started, we need to go ahead and create a new file. This is a single sided project. I'm going to go with a 12 and a half inch width in X, a 12 and a half inch height in Y, and I'm going to go with a thickness of 0.75 nominal, working in inches. My Z0, as usual, will be the material surface. My XY datum position for layout purposes is in the center. For my modeling resolution, I'm going to go ahead and run with very high. Click OK. To import a model that was created in another program, there's a couple of ways we can do it. I tend to use the menus up here, and I'll click on File, Import, then come down to Import Component or 3D Model. And I'll navigate over to my model, double click it to load it. And we end up in, what the what? We end up in this window here. This is the window that confuses a lot of folks. This is simply VCarve's way of asking you where you want this placed, how big it's supposed to be, which side of the model you want to face up and carve. It imports in what's known as an orthographic view meaning it's not straight on looking at it from the top as it would be in a Z view. It's kind of rocked backwards a little bit, tipped in X with this edge downwards a little bit. We can change that view up here in this area. We can go ahead and click a Z view here to look at it straight down from above. We can click a straight X view to look at it along the X axis running this direction. We can click the Y view, which doesn't really change it much because it is a round file, but we're looking at the Y along this axis here. To go back to a straight Z view, we just click on Z up here. And to go back into that orthographic view, we click this one here, and that rocks it back, spins it around slightly. Now, when it is first imported, the STL file, VCarve will default to where you're looking at it from the top. This square area out here is a zero plane that automatically gets added as you import the file. We're looking at the top view in the orthographic view again, but we could look at it from the right. Now, if we look at this here, we're looking at the right side of the model, and you see how our zero plane has changed to accommodate that. With this being a round circular file, if I change to the front, about all it does is spin around so that I'm actually looking at the bottom of the model. I'm looking at the bottom of this shape. This is mainly used in something like if you were importing uh, a model of a car, like is shown here in this ex these examples over here. You could look at the top, the right side, the left side, the front, the rear, whichever. If we look straight at the bottom here, we see the zero plane is on top, and there's not a whole heck of a lot we can do with this. And the same thing with the left side, the same thing with the back. Generally speaking, we'll want our initial orientation almost always to be the top, especially if it's a flat type of a model like this one is. The rotation about the z-axis is basically, imagine a pin in the center, and if you rotate this, 
the edges will spin around the center. So with this being basically a round symmetrical pattern, if I do rotate it 90 degrees, you can't really see a difference. Or 180 degrees from there, you can't really see much of a difference. It is a symmetrical pattern. If it only had these flourishes here on the top and bottom, and we flipped it 90 degrees, obviously they would spin around and you would get a different view of the model. But because this is symmetrical and it is round, changing the rotation of this model is not really, doesn't really have much of an effect. This section here is the interactive rotation. Right now, we're rotating when I come out here and click my left mouse button and I move it around. I hold the, the left mouse button. I'm rotating the view of the entire model along with the zero plane. If I were to come along and click one of these over here, I would be rotating the model without rotating the zero plane. Be very careful if you use this because it is possible to make a change, make a move. I'll go ahead and demonstrate. If I come over here and click XYZ rotation of the model, the model moves and you see these disappear. This area here is below the zero plane. That is not going to be imported. If I go back to my view here, we see how the model is now skewed this way. Go to a straight X view, and we see it's been moved all over the place. You can get things turned around to where the model is no longer usable. So be very careful using the interactive rotation of just the model. You can try to bring it back into position here as best you can by just going straight X, lifting that up, and that kind of works a little bit. Let's go straight Y and zoom in and adjust what I have found to be the best way to go at this point when I've got it moved around and twisted around and so horked up that I'm missing half of my model in here. I just cancel and start over. Cancel. Brought me back into the 3D view. I'll go File, Import, Component, or 3D Model and start over. We'll leave our interactive rotation in XYZ. It does have its place, but not for something like this. Down in this area here we have the model size. Now I chose this model for a couple of reasons. Well, notice we have lock XYZ ratio checked. Any change we make down here in any of these for model size It'll keep the aspect ratio correct. Everything will be kept proportionate and scaled. One of the reasons I chose this model was because I knew it was metric. And if we look here, we have in X 369.46, but it's marked inches. Now, I know there's no way this was 369 inches it was drawn in metric. 369 millimeters possibly, but not inches. So we have this button down here. Scale millimeters to inches. What I'll do is I'll make sure inches is checked and I'll just click this button and we have scaled it down to where it's actually being modeled in inches. Now you'll notice that this red box appeared under here. That is our piece of material. Our material is only 12 and a half inches square. I can further scale this 
by just coming over here and making a change in either X or Y, it doesn't matter, and say 12.0 inches, both of them change, and it changes our Z depth because we have locks XYZ ratio checked. I'll click Apply, and now our model will fit in our piece of material. Another way of doing this is go ahead and accept it at the size it was. Then when we finish here in the Orient Model window, we could go back into Job Setup and change our material size. So either way, they both accomplish more or less the same thing. Down here, we have our zero plane position in the model. If we look at it from the edge here, let's go for a straight X view, we can see that the model is sitting on top of the zero plane. I can adjust this to move the model down, but if I do that, I'm also removing portions of the model that are going to be carved. Everything you see in gray will not be carved. So we'll want to keep that slider down here and our model lifted up above the zero plane. Now there's a button right here that says center model. Go ahead and click that but we see what happens is again it did place the center of the model on that zero plane but it also removed a lot of the details that we want to carve. Now this does come in handy if you're cutting again something like this car here. If you only wanted to carve half of the models left side for the sake of discussion. You can center the model, then adjust from here just how much of that one profile you wanted to carve. We'll go ahead and drag our zero plane position down to the bottom so that it's underneath the model and all of our detail will be carved. Go back to the orthographic view. Now here we have two check boxes here. One is to create both sides of the model. Now, this model is a hollow form. I don't want to do that. If it was something like this car, I might want to make this a two sided project and cut both sides of it. But because this is a, a medallion or a piece of ornamentation that's meant to be carved into the surface of a piece of material, I don't need the bottom. So what I've done is I've selected discard data below the zero plane. That means that anything that may have been below this zero plane would be completely disregarded. So to briefly recap, what we're doing in the Orient 3D model window is we're setting our initial orientation of which view we want to see of the model, figuring out how we want to rotate the model within this window. We're selecting the model size, units, and adjusting the zero plane position to expose as much or as little of this model that we actually want to carve. After all of this has been entered and decided on. We click OK, and that model is imported into our file. It's now just like any other 3D model that we would choose out of the clip art. So with it imported, we now see that we have our scroll model on level one. That's the only component that we have. So we can go over to our drawing toolpath, go into our 3D view. With it selected, I want to add a vector around the outside of it so that when we go to machine it, I have a profile that I can use to cut out. 
So again, I'll make sure it's selected, go over to the Modeling tab, and up here, Create Vector Boundary Around Selected Components. I'll click that icon, zoom in, and here we can see I have a vector that I can now select to use as my profile. If I sound like I'm finished with this model, it's because I am. That's really all there is to importing a model that was created in another software program into vCarve. I've got my model here. I've got my vector out here. I'm actually ready to start calculating toolpaths. So, let's go ahead and do so. With the model selected, hold down shift and select that vector. I'm going to do a 3D roughing toolpath. Now this is automatically taking me into material setup and here's where we confirm that the thickness of our material is three quarters of an inch. My XY datum is in the center. I'm going to move it to the bottom left now because I have no more layout work to do. I'm ready to go ahead and change that to the bottom left because that's where I set my X, Y, and Z zero out on the CNC machine. Z zero is going to stay there. This is going to remain unchanged. I'll go down here, click OK. Now we get into the roughing machining toolpath. I'm going to again use a ball nose quarter inch bit and I was asked about this why I use a ball nose bit and not a standard end mill to rough out a 3D model. Basically my answer is this this is the way I was taught to do it. It works. I have never had reason to question it. I will give it a try and see if using an end mill speeds anything up or slows it down. But using a ball nose bit so far has served me well and I've just never seen the need to question it. I am going to check on my step over here. I'm running a step over of about 30%. That's fine. Let's take note that my pass depth is an eighth of an inch. That's going to become uh, a factor here pretty quick. I'll go ahead and click OK. I, I selected the model and I selected that vector that I put around the model. In the past I have shown you we have machined to the model boundary and adding the zero plane makes the entire piece of material the 3D model. With this vector here, I can select machine to the selected vector and it will machine only to that vector. Well, the problem is if I machine only to that vector, that means my bit's going to come down here and plunge and then lift up and go back over for its next pass. So what I want to do is I want it to come out beyond that vector just a little bit to give me a little bit of clearance for my finishing bit. So I'm going to set a boundary offset of my tool's diameter. In this case, a quarter of an inch. That means the bit as it comes along in machines, it's going to go past this vector a quarter of an inch just to clear away this material out here to make room for my finishing bit which may not be able to cut this deep into the material. Again I'm going to go with a machining allowance of 25 thousandths of an inch meaning when this roughing toolpath cuts it's going to leave 25 thousandths of an inch of material to be removed in the finishing toolpath. For the roughing strategy, I'm going to use a Z-level strategy. 
what that means is it's going to come in here in these black areas where the cuts are the deepest and it's going to machine these out. It's going to machine a certain portion of these darker gray areas here, but not a lot. And it will go down to its pass depth, which was, if you remember, an eighth of an inch. Clear away the material it can clear. Then make a second pass a little bit deeper up to its pass depth. So if it has to cut down a quarter of an inch, it'll do it in two passes. From there, I'll just go ahead and calculate this 3D roughing tool path. And we see where the toolpath is going to machine. I'll go ahead and I'll preview. And you can see the material it's going to remove in two passes. It's leaving all of this behind to be machined away by the finishing toolpath. And that's fine. Now, here's the reason why I use, tend to use Z level on large files like this. Remember, this is a 12 inch diameter piece that we're going to be cutting here. I'll close my preview and I'll come over here to summary of all toolpaths including estimated times and I'll take a look and this is going to take 21 minutes to cut. Okay, so let's remember that for just a second. I'll go back, I'll edit the toolpath, but I'm going to change to 3D Raster. Now 3D Raster is going to come along and it's going to carve back and forth the entire model, leaving that 25 thousandths of an inch behind. I'll raster along X because that's the direction my grain is running on the piece of material I have. We'll calculate. I'll reset my preview and kind of remember what that looks like here. I'll reset my preview. Now I'll preview this recalculated roughing tool path. And we'll see what it does here. It's going to go back and forth. It's going to carve the entire model in two passes at that 30% step over plunging down to its pass depth of uh, an eighth of an inch, machine the entire file, then come back and make a second pass, removing even more material, but leaving that 25 thousandths machining allowance. And we see here, not only does it take longer to calculate this toolpath, it'll also take longer to run this toolpath out on the CNC machine. I'll show you what I mean right now. Close the preview. We'll go back over here to summary of all toolpaths. It went from a 20 minute carve to an hour and 27 minutes because it's plunging down and it's following all of this detail here, going back and forth twice, rather than just carving away these deep areas that my finishing bit won't be able to get to. That's why I tend to use Z-level roughing strategy, rastering with the direction of the grain of my material. We'll recalculate that toolpath, reset the preview, and I'll preview that toolpath. And even though it makes two passes, it's still a 21 minute carve. That's the difference. So, with our roughing toolpath calculated, we can now go over to our finishing toolpath.
I have the vector selected. Hold down shift, select the model, and we'll do a 3D finishing toolpath. This time I have selected a ball nose instead of an end mill, and I've selected my sixteenth of an inch diameter ball nose. Let me hit edit here. I'm going to run, uh, run a step over of 9% to get a nice detailed 3D carve here because there are some small corners in this area here. A small step over anywhere from 8 to 9% would give me a real good finish here. But keep in mind 9% step over is only a little over five and a half thousandths. Meaning it'll make one pass, move over five and a half thousandths, make its next pass. This is why 3D models take so long to carve. Another factor is feed rate and plunge rate. Now on a sixteenth of an inch bit, 10 inches per minute is a little bit of overkill. I'm going to raise these up uh, I'm going to leave my feed rate at 40 for calculation purposes, but I'm going to jump this up to 20, half my feed rate, and I'll click OK. The reason I start with such low feed rates is because, as I was taught long ago, I start with a conservative feed rate, see how it's cutting outside, then I'll bump up my feed rate on the fly. I'm going to machine to the selected vector, this vector that I put around the outside of the model, with a boundary offset of an eighth of an inch. I'm going to raster, use a master raster strategy with an angle of zero, meaning it's going to go from side to side to match the grain of the material I have on the machine. I'll calculate the tool path. And there is our finishing tool path. And you can see this is solid blue. We have to zoom way in to see any individual steps or paths that the bit is going to take. Let's go ahead and preview that selected toolpath. Okay, there we go. If we take a look in here, we can see there's a few little areas where there might need a little bit of sanding. But overall, in general, this is going to be a nice clean carve. I could go with a smaller bit. I could increase modeling resolution. But we need to keep a few things in perspective here. And that is the amount of time it's going to take to carve this model. Let's go back over here into the summary of all toolpaths. And as it sits right now, that 3D finishing toolpath is going to take 10 hours by itself. That's going to be a big, big problem for some people. Now, there's not a lot you can do about that. There are some things you can do. Let me go back into my 3D finishing toolpath. Let me edit the plunge rate. We'll bump that up to 25 inches per minute, and we'll bump the feed rate to 50. That will help, but it's still pretty conservative. The reason I'm worrying about the plunge rate at all is because a 3D model, a 3D carving, is just as dependent on the plunge rate sometimes even more so than the feed rate. 
We'll calculate the tool path here. I'm going to leave everything else the same. We'll recalculate. When you're 3D carving, the Z is almost constantly in motion, going up, coming down, as it carves all these details. It can only carve as fast as that plunge rate will allow. You can enter a thousand inches per minute for a feed rate, but if your plunge rate is 10 inches per minute, that's as fast as that machine is going to move. So yes, I have my plunge rate for this particular toolpath set at 25 inches per minute. That's how fast this file is going to carve. This is the other reason why 3D carving takes so long. A lot of people don't realize that the bit's plunge rate decides how fast that machine is going to move. It wouldn't make any sense to preview this toolpath we're going to get the same result here. The only thing I changed was the feed rate and plunge rate. So let's close the preview and go up here and take a look at the estimated time. We're down to, uh, you might as well say, 8 hours. 8 hours and 20 minutes is the total carving time for this. So we've saved 2 hours by bumping the plunge rate up an additional five inches per minute. That's what I mean when I say the plunge rate is just as important as the feed rate. Doesn't matter what the feed rate is set at, your controller software will not let it go any faster than whatever the plunge rate is for the bit. We'll go ahead and close that. The last tool path we have remaining click off and just select the vector. We want to do a profile. I'm going to cut to 0.755 because my material is three quarters of an inch. I want to cut about five thousandths beyond that to make sure it goes all the way through the material. That'll be in six passes. That's okay. I'm going to use a quarter inch end mill. That's okay. I'm going to cut to the outside of this vector. I am going to do a separate last pass with an allowance of 0 0.01. I am going to add tabs. They will be 3D tabs, half inch long, quarter inch tall. I'll edit my tabs. I'll add tabs here and it placed one down here at the bottom. I want to put these tabs over here in the corners because I'm going to be fastening my material down in the corners. I want these tabs out here to hold this piece in place because the bit is probably going to cut some of this out. So by putting my tabs over here in the corners, my clamps or screws out here should hold this in place. So. Close that. That's all I need to worry about on this one. I'll calculate it. It's going to cut through the material. I want it to. And we'll preview that toolpath. And there we go. I can come along, take my material up off of the uh, machine cut those tabs and we have medallion here. It's going to need, might need a little bit of uh, cleaning up, a little sanding around the edge, but that's okay. So there it is, importing a 3D model from an STL file into vCarve. I hope you got something out of this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up. And if you'd like to follow along with the rest of this series, any of my other CNC adventures, or any of my laser adventures, I do hope you'll subscribe to my channel.
But, as usual, whether you subscribe to my channel or not, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch, and y'all take care.